Hey, what is up fellow gamers? It's going to be a very short update of my unnamed NES survival game. Not that many changes this time, but I'm making this video because I have received an item that is very special to me and I want to share my joy with you. But I'm going to talk about it later. Let's go through the changes in the game first. While making the previous video, I've noticed that it's quite impossible to tell which item was selected. For instance, if you want to drop something. So I added a second pointer sprite to the menu. So when the sub menu pops up, you can actually see to which item this sub menu belongs to. Also I added an additional pointer sprite to the crafting screen. Since there is only two possible ingredients, when you craft an item, now you can see what was the first item you have selected. So it's a little less confusing. The last change was a bit bigger and it impacts the gameplay quite a lot. I have to admit it was super hard to hit bunnies or doggos, especially during the situations when you accidentally walked on them. I did some investigation, I checked other NES games and every game I checked had some sort of collision detection between the player and other characters, so the player would not go through them, especially if those characters were hostile. There was even some sort of collision response, like the player bouncing back from the enemy. So I decided to implement at least some basic collision detection into my game as well. If I would write an ideal code, the player character would be one of the NPCs. But unfortunately, the player is a completely separate thing. So the first step was to check if the player bumped into one of the NPCs. Of course, if an NPC would move towards the player at that moment, the player would get trapped. So I just had to implement another check for each NPC so that an NPC would know if it bumped into player or not. I don't know, maybe I had some kind of a brain fart at that moment, but I just only checked current NPC positions with the player square. And I completely forgot that each NPC had their own movement direction. So this led to issues like the player character and any random NPC bumping into each other and sticking together where both of them could not move. But then I got more serious and using the NPC's movement direction I calculated a new potential coordinate that could be used for both environment and player collision checks. If everything was okay and there were no obstacles, I would assign those new coordinates to the NPC. And if not, I would just stick to the old coordinates. Looks like it worked nicely and I don't think it's possible for the player to get glued with an NPC anymore. And no, I'm not checking the collisions between each NPC because the game has become laggy enough, especially when there are a lot of bunnies on the screen. By the way, now I could finally remove those hacks that I added to the villager hut maps. So you could not go through the bear or the hedgehog. I actually had a separate collision map for the moment when the bear goes to sleep. So I no longer need that as well. Also, I think my changes fixed a strange issue when a random NPC would go through all the obstacles to the very edge of the map and would be eventually trapped there. But most importantly, it's much easier to hit NPCs now and it's way less annoying. So there's another thing that happened. I was always saying I'm making an NES game, but all I had to test this game on was a bunch of Famicoms. Well, yeah, in general, the Famicom and the NES is basically the same thing, but the NES is still a bit different. I must confess, I haven't even seen an actual NES in real life. So I decided to finally get my grubby hands on the real NES. Previously, I hesitated to get it because 
they were quite expensive. But now I said to myself, I only live once, so I must have it. And by saying expensive, I was talking about the American NES. Sure, I could get an European one cheaper, but as you might know, the PAL region NES has a different slower CPU and a PPU that limits the system to output only 50 frames per second. Since nobody bothered to fully port their games for Europeans, the majority of titles for the PAL region are not quite right. Let's take a Darkwing Duck as an example. The PAL version of it only has an adapted music, so the music on PAL console would sound just fine, but the character movement would be slow as heck. If you plug the same cartridge into Famicom using an adapter, you would see that the gameplay is fine, but the music sounds quite weird. So that's why I always looked for an American version of the NES exclusives. Since I already have a stack of those, it was a logical decision for me to get an American system as well. The problem always was the price. The shipping and import taxes usually made the final price quite bloated and unattractive. This time I went for the cheapest possible option on eBay and grabbed this piece of junk for 40 bucks. I waited for a few weeks and finally got this shoebox. Yo, I can't believe that I finally have an actual NES. Wow! Since it's the console only, how can I possibly turn it on? I grabbed an universal European DC adapter that's set to 9 volts. Sure, the NES takes AC power, but in theory there should be no difference if you plugged an DC adapter. For the gamepad I used a gamepad from the AV Famicom. Yeah, the lead is very short, but at least the connector fits. So it was a moment of truth. Will my new NES actually work? I popped a game in and well of course it didn't work. What did I expect? I guessed it was the cartridge slot's fault so it was time to open the NES up. It sure had a lot of screws and even more dirt inside. It wasn't that simple to get to the cartridge slot, I had to figure out how to disassemble everything. Let's take a look at the main board itself. Still looks alright. So all I had to do to make the console work again was to clean the contacts with some isopropyl alcohol and a credit card, like this. I'm really glad I didn't need to replace those contacts. So yeah, it was a pretty easy fix and the console started working. I also had to thoroughly clean the pins of every cartridge I had. It's also funny how blowing on the cartridge pins is very effective on this system. It never worked with Famicoms or Mega Drive. But here it's like phenomenal. Of course the humidity of your breath is not that great for the old electronics. So yeah, everything works now, the picture is pretty nice. I haven't changed any capacitors though. Probably I should because the system is as old as I am. I just washed the case, cleaned all the gunk that was inside, so now the console is nice and clean. The only mistake I made was to clean the Sharpie markings on the case with some acetone. Yeah, don't do crap like that. Now my goal will be to run my own game on this console. Yeah, I could get an EverDrive or something, but where's the fun in that? So I started making something. The biggest obstacle here would be to defeat the protection system the NES has. And no, I'm not going to disable the CIC chip, because I want to 
leave the console as authentic as possible. I will tell more how it went in my next video. So if you're interested, you definitely should subscribe my channel. So I guess that's it for now. Thanks for watching. You can find the links to my game in the description. And I will see you in the next video. Bye.